Well, malaria is one of the oldest diseases that we know that's affected humankind. Um, probably had its origins in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and um, and that would be you know 100,000 years ago um, or more. Um, it really becomes a serious problem probably about 10 to 6,000 years uh, BC uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and eventually spreads out from there into other parts of the globe. Um, one of the most important things to know about malaria is it's not necessarily a tropical disease. That is, it has had historically much wider distribution than it currently has. Um, and if you look even at the end of the 19th century, there were cases of malaria that were occurring in uh, Canada, uh, they were occurring in uh, wide areas of Europe. Uh, in 1922-23, there was an epidemic, major epidemic of malaria in Archangel, which is a city some 200 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. What all these places have in common, however, is that you have a situation in which you have a convergence of the, uh, a mosquito that can transmit the disease, uh, the parasite that causes the disease, and a human population that's susceptible to the disease. And those things come together at particular points in time and they often come together because of larger forces that are shaping society. So malaria is clearly a disease that is shaped by broader patterns of social and economic development. Um, and you can see that uh, in early uh, Rome uh, in the fourth century, where malaria becomes a very serious problem uh, in the areas around Rome. And it's associated with uh, economic and social disruptions associated with warfare. Uh, and the abandonment of land. And you can see it as well in the other areas in which it spreads into Europe. Um, malaria probably enters into the Americas uh, sometime uh, in perhaps the 15th century. Um, and as best we can tell, it comes from Western Europe and arrives um, primarily from early European settlers. Uh, many of the English-speaking settlers who settled in the uh, colonial America came from areas of England that were infected by uh, Vivax malaria. And so you have episodes and descriptions of malaria in the lowlands of South Carolina, Maryland, Virginia, uh, as well as stretching up further north um, from the 16th century forward. Sometime at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, you begin to get uh, the introduction of falciparum malaria, which is the more deadly form of the disease. And that, as far as we can tell, arrives uh, on the board of slave ships uh, and with Africans who are brought over from um, Africa to work on plantations in the Caribbean, Latin America, the United States, uh, what becomes the United States. Um, and from those coastal areas where it emerges, it spreads inland along with settlers moving into the interior. And by, as I said, the end of the 19th century, malaria is, uh, occurs from you know, the farthest northern areas of the United States down to the Gulf Coast. Uh, it occurs uh, from one Atlantic to the Pacific in various places. Since the end of the 19th century and the discoveries regarding the um, biology of malaria, the role of the Anopheles mosquito in transmitting malaria, you have had the development of a number of interventions um, to control the disease. Um, discovery of the role of the mosquito and the role of the parasite didn't create a single answer, but rather a number of possibilities. And you have approaches which uh, basically attack the mosquito, eliminating breeding. And if you can eliminate breeding of mosquitoes or eliminate the adult mosquitoes or certainly reduce their numbers, you can end transmission. And so a lot of what has been done in a number of places had to do with controlling the vector population. Uh, and this could be done through eliminating breeding sites, through providing protections such as nets or screening, um, all of which were basically aimed at preventing mosquitoes from biting humans. The alternative was to attack the parasite. And it was believed early on that if you could eliminate the parasites within the human population, it didn't really matter if you had mosquitoes running around biting because there wouldn't be any parasites to transfer from one human to the other. This was an approach that was particularly developed in Italy uh, under, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and from 
roughly 1902 through 1910, there was a major campaign in which they distributed quinine to everyone in the population who was susceptible or at risk of malaria. Um, their goal was to actually eradicate the disease by eliminating all the parasites. Actually, quinine didn't do that, but it did dramatically reduce mortality. There were debates that went on in Europe and elsewhere about the viability or the effectiveness of these two approaches, attacking the parasite or attacking the mosquito. And the weight went back and forth from one to the other across the most of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. However, by the 1940s, when World War II comes around, you see the emergence of long-acting insecticides, and primarily DDT. Um, and that more or less pushes the, the pendulum toward approaches which are aimed at eliminating um, the vectors. Um, before that, the ways in which you eliminated vectors were fairly costly. You had to you know, do drainage and um, lots of activities which um, really couldn't have been, uh, were expensive for local communities. But DDT was relatively cheap. Uh, it could be spread over large areas. It lasted for long periods of time before you had to respray. And so DDT became, and pesticides became, the major instrument for um, fighting malaria by the end of World War II. Um, the successes that were achieved uh, by using DDT, and in some places actually eradicating the disease, led a number of malaria specialists and public health authorities to believe that it was, in, in fact, possible that you could use DDT to eliminate the disease globally. And it was this confidence in DDT, plus the fear that DDT might be lost as a weapon as mosquitoes develop resistance to it, that led the World Health Assembly uh, in 1955 to vote for the program for the global malaria eradication of malaria, of the global eradication of malaria. Um, and that program ran from 55 up until 1969. Uh, it had major successes, uh, but particularly in more temperate areas of the world. Um, malaria was eliminated from southern Europe, where it still existed in the southern United States. It was eradicated in a large number of countries that were fell into one of three categories. Either they were relatively well off economically, they were island nations, which made it relatively easy to eradicate the disease, or they were socialist governments in um, Europe um, uh, and the fact of them being socialist was less to do with their economic policies than the fact that many of these countries had well-developed primary health care systems. And this contributed to um, their success in controlling the uh, malaria. There were lots of other places where malaria was brought down dramatically, and certainly mortality was brought down dramatically, um, including India, large areas of South Southeast Asia. Um, eradication wasn't really attempted in Sub-Saharan Africa, except for in South Africa, and there were successes in South Africa. In most of those places where eradication wasn't achieved, efforts to achieve eradication dragged on and for a number of reasons um, didn't achieve their goals. And by 69, um, the World Health Organization decided it was time to, to evaluate what had been achieved. And what they decided was that in the areas where malaria had not been eradicated, it didn't look like it was going to be eradicated in the near future, um, and that, in fact, they should step back from eradication and implement control programs with the hope that eventually they'd be able to eradicate early 90s uh, around what becomes known as rollback malaria. Um, the difference between rollback malaria and the earlier eradication campaign had to do with one, a different set of strategies being employed to control malaria. Um, secondly, that it was not just WHO leadership, WHO UNICEF, which had run the eradication campaign, but a whole range of organizations. There have been dramatic successes, mostly around the use of bed nets, um, the success they've had controlling uh, falciparum malaria with um, ACTs, uh, and um, different programs for intervening in malaria in pregnancy uh, and intervening rapidly in emergency situations such as associated with refugee populations.